Hi, welcome to Lead with Love podcast. I'm your host, Christy, and I am super thrilled to be sharing conscious content that I know will be a game changer for you in your life. Every aspect of our journey requires growth for change so that we can evolve into our best selves. And in each one of these episodes, we're going to lead with the intention to water our souls, feed our minds, and inspire ourselves to love more and deeper. It's so important that we begin to love where we've been, love where we are, and love where we are growing. Well, hello there in Santa Monica. Hello. <laughs> Look at you, smiling, happy as always, a ray of sh- a pocket full of sunshine. Beautiful day, some cup of coffee. Mm. Any reason not to be wagging the tail? No. No, no, no. I'm wagging my tail too. You just can't see it. It's it's yeah. a beautiful day in the yeah. neighborhood. <laughs> exactly. So thank you so much for taking the time to be on here in this beautiful Saturday morning. You kidding? Thanks for inviting me. I always love hanging and playing with the lovely Christy Dryling. Back to you. I was, uh, you know, I, I really don't feel like there's an introduction needed because everyone that's on here, you know, has probably Googled you or researched you and, and uncovered, you know, just the, 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 the brilliant soul that you are. And I say brilliant soul because I feel like your soul is what radiates even more than your accomplishments. And you know, thank you. True. It's the only reason why we're still really great friends because you're you're such a pure soul. And and that's why I was drawn to you and attracted to you. And and in the first place, because your heart's in the right place. And not only that, but your mind is just absolutely incredible. And the work that you've you've done in your life and what you've created in your life is, I mean, it's changed the world. And you continue to change the world. You continue to show up. You inspire me every day to be better and to do better. And you call me out, which I love. You're like, Christy, I'm going to call you out. And I'm like, please call me out. Oh, that, yeah, yeah. (laughs) That one hurt a little because I needed it. (laughs) You know, there's nothing as loving as as being raw, naked, truthful with one another, right? Exactly. Thank you for clothed right now. (laughs) Yeah. As long as that that's in the embrace of wanting us all to be the best best possible version of ourselves. It's true. It's true. You know, um, a good friend of mine the other day had mentioned to me, she had said, Christy, what I love so much about, um, what I admire about you is you're unapologetically authentic. And I had never heard of that. And I thought, wow, I really feel like that's also who you are too. Like you're unapologetically authentic in everything that you do. Like what you show up as is who you are here. Or if I'm, you know, someone's having dinner with you at the dinner table. And that's what I love so much. So grateful to have you here today. Thank you. So Gary, I, you know, can we just start off for a lot of the people that may not know a little bit about your background? Could you, can you just share a little bit about, just a little bit about yourself? That would be wonderful. Yes, of course. Um, thank you. You know, I, um, what would I say about myself? Um, You know, I started life as this um, very daydreamy, shy, introverted, private sort of kid uh, who really didn't want to be seen or noticed. I I was the kid who never raised his hand in school. Um, But what happened, you know, the the silver lining that's connected all what seemed perhaps uh, unrelated or disparate choices is really one thing. And it's storytelling. I just love getting, pulling people's stories out of them. And I see life as a movie. And I just, I, I just think this whole thing is magical. And I love exploring it that through that prism or lens of story. Anyway, so I started, I fell in love with the Scarlet Pimpernel at age eight. Uh, uh, you know, my first, the first book that really just like took me down that rabbit hole. Uh, I've produced all the concerts at UC Berkeley. I've worked for Columbia Records. I founded my own independent record label at one point, thinking that was my path. That really wasn't. Um, I became a criminal defense lawyer, thinking, uh, you know, how romantic to champion the underdog. And I was a defense lawyer, uh, thinking the courtroom was the perfect theater where you have to learn to tell a persuasive story. Uh, that was, you know, if our lives are a series of chapters, that chapter was the most delicious, extraordinary, unimaginable gift in my life. 
Uh, but that also, much like music, was not really the perfect um, uh, fit for my temperament, for my temperament, for my soul, for my dharma, what have you. Uh, so I, I decided I'd run away to the circus and do the other thing that really screamed at me, which was uh, being a storyteller in the film business and, you know, sort of breaking into Hollywood and and working with a lot of young talent, writers and directors and whatnot. And that's fundamentally, I mean, I've done other things. I have side ventures, I write book, you know, occasionally, but, uh, you know, film film turned out to be exactly the right thing for me. Um, so I've been very blessed to be able to have a, a you know, a wonderful career in Hollywood and uh, while juggling other wonderful friends and pursuits and opportunities. That's what I love, you know, what I love about, one of the things I love about you, obviously, is your, your, your pursuit for just becoming more and more each and every day. And like every soul that you meet, you just really value the, deli- you know, their, their deliciousness. As you, I just like, delicious is your word. I, how did you fell into success? What was that like for you? Could you share a few situations where you, 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 you fell and you fell hard and then you picked yourself back up? So a couple of questions there, if you don't mind. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I, I have pretty much failed the whole of my life. Um, and I think failure gets a bad rap. I mean, failure is, you know, not, it's, uh, it's not a fearful, you know, dragon. Um, it's not a terrible thing. It, it just tells me that I'm playing it full on in the game of life. Um, so I look at it as, gosh, you know, it's Thomas Watson, the founder of IBM years ago, had a wonderful quote. He said, if you want to increase your, I, I'm going to get the quote wrong, so forgive me, Thomas Watson, but it's basically, if you want to increase your rate of success, double your rate of failure. They're, they are the twins that were really never even separated at birth. They are one and the same experience. It means that you're applying yourself in the world um, that you're not afraid to take a chance. It's the only way that we grow, that we expand, that we grow muscle, that we become confident, that so many, that we build relationships. It's like some of my greatest successes and uh, relationships and results, successes, were birthed out of a massive failure. And but for that failure, those, those conversations, those opportunities, those moments might never have bubbled to the surface. Uh, I, I really believe that they are integral. It's the yin and the yang. It's the duality of life. I mean, I failed to get into the law school of my choice. I failed uh, when I came to Hollywood, the first project I after I lost $80,000. This was in the early 80s. My God, that might have been, well have been $800,000 back then to me. It was all borrowed money. I had no idea how to pay it back. It just made me more stubborn. By the way, all the while, through all the failures, we all have this, right? We have that thing called mind. We have that monkey chorus of voices um, that um, someone once recently said, gosh, you know, if others spoke to you the way you speak to yourself internally, number one, you'd invite them out of your life immediately. Number two, on some days, they're so badly behaved, you'd have them institutionalized, right? And it's true. We are very unkind and very ungenerous often, to ourselves. I've had that. We all have that. It's just built in. We come out of the factory with that. But I think you have to decide if your mission is great enough. And if it is, then your fear and your voices have to take a back seat. Mm -hmm. And you know, if your mission is not great enough, if you get stopped. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, there's several things that like I've always thought, and then I'm going to stop for a moment, but I've always thought that one of my, is I wouldn't call it a value, but one of my top traits or drivers, the thing I'm really appreciative for in my life is a sort of limitless curiosity um, about people, about life, about science, about you name it. I'm just curious. And I, I'm just constantly reading and learning and, you know, like trying to expand the canvas from which I think and operate. Um, and what I, what I, what I, what I learned over the years about curiosity, Dor- Dorothy Parker has a wonderful quote. She says, 
the cure for boredom is curiosity and there is no cure for curiosity. Um, but the thing that I really came to personally recognize about curiosity was that was the thing uh, more often than not that motored me through all the self-doubt, all of those limiting beliefs, all of those holdbacks, right? That energy, because it's very hard. There are certain things that we can't, there, you know, like the, the, there are certain things that just there's no room for both at the same time in the same space in this being or this body, right? Um, I think it's very hard to be uh, fearful if you're deeply curious in the moment. It's There's like this childlike sense of wonder about the world and it just makes fear take a, a, a time out. I think that gratitude has a similar effect, you know. Esther Hicks talks about, you know, forking. It's like 17 seconds is as much as our we, we can extend ourselves. And, and every seven, 17 seconds, you, you just self-talk positively out loud, loud, you know, like a song. And you just, you just get yourself into a frenzy of positivity and it becomes, you start laughing and it, you, you actually get high on it. Um, I think curiosity and gratitude are two of the things that just put a cork in the moment, in fear or self-doubt, et cetera. And the third one, which is the killer app, is take action despite force yourself past the noise mm. and take action. When you're in action, that's like we learn by doing, we get confident by doing, we, you know, we, we're never gonna lose this, but we have a choice to make. Mm. It's so beautiful. I actually was thinking as you were talking about a time in my life, in my past, where um, I had, had spoke in front of, a, you know, 11,000 people, my first time to be on stage. And I was so scared. I remember calling my friend, Dr. Shad Helmstetter. I said, Shad, like, I didn't act, like, I know one day I want to do this, but I'm, I'm scared. I don't know what to do. Like, right. I don't know what to say, you know, and he, and, uh, you know, Dr. Shad, he wrote what to say when you talk to yourself. Uh, which is a classic book, right? And wow. he and he said to me, you know, Christy, you just need to step outside of yourself and be an observer looking, you know, from the outside in. And I'm like, I don't know what that means. I'm still scared. I'm afraid, like, I don't know what to say. Like, I'm just doing what I do. They want me to talk about what I do. I don't know what I do. I just do what I do. And so I, you know, was in this panic. And anyway, I, I wound up, you know, getting the right outfit, making sure it looked like a million dollars on stage, you know, the right haircut, the makeup, nails, everything was done. And I get up there and, you know, I'm just delivering this, you know, this impact. And evidently, you know, one of my jokes, um, the audience thought was funny, but that the, the CEO at the time did not think it was so funny because uh, he was a past attorney. So he kind of he kind of like got on my my rear about it. And the way the fear after that, because I was so scared already and all I wanted to do was change lives. And now I, I felt like I just, I upset, I ruined people's lives. That's not what I wanted to do. Oh my gosh. It all, you know, and so I went into this little cave and I was like, so like, I literally was so sad, so scared, so afraid, went home, just hid my, my, the business I was booming and creating started taking a dive because I went into the dark night of the soul. I'm such a horrible person like how could I have done that how could... all this stuff right and so it was like all this happened and I remember like I got into some major financial issues because I pulled out and I was just in the dark night of the soul I wound up getting into a quarter of a million dollars in tax debt and I felt like such a loser like I was like I'm a phony I'm a phony people look at me and they think I do this and I'm that and I'm like I'm I'm not that at all. And I, and, and I just remember hearing this voice and the voice said, are you having fun yet? Are you having fun yet? Because that's not what you came here to do. You came here to inspire people and you need it. You need to get it together. Or otherwise it's, it's going to only get worse. And that's not what you're here for. And so I got my stuff together really quickly. And what was interesting, because after that dark night of the soul, I was building my, you know, I just started pouring into other people and I said, get out of my way. And because of what happened, I went to another country and built a business in another country and, and literally thousands of lives were changed from that, what I thought was a negative story and a failure and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, it's such a great, that what we think is bad, what we think is a negative, what we think is the dark night of the soul, actually always from my, if you're in growth mode, always has a positive ending. Yeah. 
You know, it's interesting. I agree a thousand percent. And I always, I found remarkable for years, uh, these horrific stories, these tragic experiences that people have in life. And when they survive them and and come back and thrive, you, you know, they reflect back during interviews and publicly announce it was the best thing that ever happened to me. And I always thought best is a really like, what an interesting choice of word. It is the singular best out of all my life experience, the best thing ever. And it, having had one such experience, I will say, absolutely. Now I get it. It's 100% true. It starts to really clarify and make very simple. Is this aligned with me? Is that who I need to be in the world? Does that give me joy or not? Black and white, right? And you start to have a different way to measure your choices that becomes very native, very sort of essential. Um, and that's what happened with you. And I, I, I mean, it's, it's a gift. Yeah. Yeah, it, it truly is. And so it's like, even when we go through those times or those moments, or maybe the friendships, you know, uh, go away and new ones come in, right. uh, it's just to remember that the universe has our back, God has our back. And it's, it's just trusting in that, you know, Gary, I remember you telling me, um, I mean, you've told me many stories. I mean, I, I, I just, I literally, I can't wait to read your book. I cannot, I mean, I know you already have a Hollywood book, but I can't wait to read the book. Okay. Like as your friend, I just want it all in one place. I'm just, I, I'll be the first one in line to buy it. But I remember you telling me a story about a gentleman that called you up and said, I want to take you to have lunch. You changed my life. And this was a, a gentleman that made it to the top of a, a network marketing company. Do you remember that story? Oh, uh, I know who you're, I was, Jose, yeah, 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 yeah. I would just love to share that story with everybody because I think it's really powerful. I really do. Well, I mean, it, it, I, I can, I, you know, I'll top line it. It was basically, he's a very, very lovely guy. Actually, very interesting uh, personal backstory. Um, and, um, you know, grew up in Latin America from a, with, in, a, in a very, very poor family, a uh, large family. And he, um, when he was, I don't know his age, he was quite young, uh, like he was at most in his teens. Back in um, 1990, when the film Pretty Woman was released, and, um, and apparently, according to him, he, he watched that film like 100 times. And the reason he watched it so frequently was he just decided, given his education, given his family circumstance and their, 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 their lack of, of, of abundance, what have you, that he needed to shift that. And that Richard Gere, in his mind, he'd made a decision. That's who I want to be. I want to mimic everything about him. And he literally watched until he embodied, memorized, was, in his view, that character that Richard portrayed in the film. Uh, and he said, I, I, he wanted to meet me because he attributed his success and he had ascended, he literally had summited the world of multi-level marketing. And I can't remember exactly, he's been with more than one company over the many years since, uh, but it doesn't matter which ones, but he was like at the very, very tippy top. He was like a big deal in that world. And um, uh, and and he was and he was very well dressed and very elegant and very appreciative. He was just a lovely soul. But I just thought it's interesting. You know, we never know. Um, I think you know the takeaway from that is you you know, and it's wonderful to hear those stories because we saw all, it's it's really actually uh, rare. I think we hear very few relative to the whole of the number of stories where we have made a mark, where we've had an impact that was really positive that's memorable to people um, and it often doesn't get communicated. So it's very sweet when, and very generous when people reach out in, in those ways. There's a wonderful old Chinese proverb that says, a child's life is like a piece of paper on which every passerby leaves a mark. And I, it's always stayed with me because I, I believe it holds equally true for us as adults, you know, to, and, and it, it's, it's just a delicious reminder to be kind, to smile, to be genuine. Um, and in our in our personal life, in our work life, to double down on service, on caring, on quality, living in your heart, and and doing your best to ignore that little voice. Um, and I and I think that's the beautiful thing for him. Like I think part of it was he he'd grown such self belief that he didn't need to sell anyone. He 
he would find out their dreams. He'd be other focused. He'd let them know how sincere he was uh, about their dream and his own. And that every conversation is ultimately, you know, about taking, helping people take steps toward what they truly desire in life. Mm -hmm. Doesn't matter if you're talking about X or Y or Z product. Mm -hmm. It's, it's so beautiful. And, you know, when you first took that venture to go into making that film, I'm sure you were, you weren't thinking, oh, I'm going to be, you know, decades later sitting with this guy in a little cafe, hearing how, you know, that film impacted, you know, thousands of lives in his, in his world. And like, we, oh. we, we can't even begin to think like that. But what I love is that, you know, tell it, tell me a little bit about like some of the, 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 the failure that you faced when you started before, you know, making that film or was it driven from a higher force pu pushing through you? Was it driven by ego? Was it driven by both? Like, can you share just a little bit more about that? Well, every, first of all, every film is different. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I would say as a, as a producer, they all have one thing in common. If you are not full on, in love, committed, if your belief isn't absolute, then say no to the project because it is gonna take you years if you're lucky to get that from script to screen. If you actually, every film that gets made is a miracle, but it just is. It's so, it's the most collaborative medium on earth. It takes a lot of money. It takes a lot of, a big village, not a small village. You know, it, it involves many, many people in different um, uh, areas. So, um, you know, you have to be a thousand percent clear that I will walk through hot coals for years, plural, to add value to, and it's going to go off the rails. We know every film does. <clears throat> Pretty Woman was no exception. Actually, every film has had that experience. Um, so it's, it's really almost, it's, it's a very humbling experience. I wouldn't say it's out of ego that we do it. It's out of uh, just this this love of storytelling, this belief in this particular artist who wrote it, the writer, it's a, a, a belief in its ability to deliver to audiences a really meaningful experience, mm -hmm. a human experience that, that matters. And that's kind of what, you know, it's, it's a little bit idealistic, I suppose. Uh, I don't speak for all producers. It's just my mindset, I guess. But um, uh, but you do, you, 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 you know, you, you, you fail consistently. You, I mean, I don't even consider hearing the word no failure. It's just, I hear that. So it, I don't even hear it, but there's thousands and thousands and thousands of no's along the path. Um, but the, you know, but you can, I, you know, I optioned that film to a couple of different independent companies. Um, I took the original up to Sundance Institute, got a lot of notoriety, very respected, um, I optioned it to, I, I won't name the companies, but one company, the first company went into, started going to bankruptcy. I had to get it back out. Um, the next company just couldn't get it financed or cast. Richard Gary turned me down a couple of times all along. And that, that's the pretty sanitized version. There were a lot of messes, right? And then eventually out of frustration, really, um, if you just cut right to it, I sent the script to Disney, the, well, the sister label of Disney, Touchstone, to someone I'd befriended earlier in their career who'd matriculated. And I sent it to him saying, this is not for you. This is, um, you know, you are Disney. This is about a working girl, but you will read and prepare to fall in love. This writer is beyond talented. He's the rare, the rare breed that we all hope to discover. <laughs> Um, and so I'm going to tell you, I'm going to schedule right now with you a week from now, we're coming in to pitch you Disney appropriate stories, read it in the next week. We will be there. I look forward to seeing you. Goodbye. And a few days later, the phone rang and it was basically him saying, we want to buy it. And it made no sense. I, I, I challenged him. I said, I think you read the wrong script, <laughs> um, which he hadn't. Anyway, it's a long, so I'm not going to bore you. One of their films had gone off the rails, which you never know what's behind the curtain on the other part of, side of a human conversation. Uh, and they had lost their star and they had, uh, we inherited 
like God spoke and allowed us to inherit Gary Marshall as our director from that other film that was now not going forward. Um, yeah, I mean, the film was blessed from on high. I got my dream cast, even though Disney didn't originally want Julia. Richard had said no to me twice. Uh, we managed it just hmm. persistence and belief in the possibility sometimes is just enough to get across the line. You know, I know you've told that story probably a million times, you know, but I tell you, it never gets old. And I think for those that have, are listening for the first time, it's just another seed of inspiration that we can apply in our own lives. And we can relate it to different aspects of our lives where, you know, there's failure after failure, rejection after rejection, but you, you know, and you believe so much that you're willing, you're willing to do anything. And I remember saying that to myself when I started in my business, I said, I don't care if I have to knock on every door in the United States of flipping America, I will do it. I will make it no matter what it takes. And I was so like, I was ready to go pound on doors. Mm -hmm. Hi, I'm Christy. I know you don't know me, but can I come in? <laughs> but that's what success, we know this from experience. That's what success looks like. You know, I mean, if I were to make, you know, if I were to say, okay, I'm going to make a promise to self and I'm going to make a certain number of calls and I'm saying that figure to knock on door, call, whatever it is, communicate with X number of new people um, on a daily basis, you know, pick a number, two, a two, just two people, right? That's 10 people in a week. If I am horrible, let's just be honest, I suck at it. Maybe I'm just like, I'm terrible. I will succeed 10% of the time just by a fluke accident, right? <laughs> yep. Uh, right. So I will. Well, my God, you know, that's six. That's what, you know, people say, oh, we're so miseducated that, you know, we live on a report card mentality. Everything's like, you know, comparing me to someone else. It's, you know, a percentage. It's a grade. No. If you win, You've called 10 people that week and you, you win once mm -hmm. by the end of the year, you've won 50 times. I mean, this is what success looks like. It's simply not giving up, mm -hmm. right? Sticking true to, to, to yourself and to, to whatever the vision is that you made you pick up the phone in the first place. It's, it's really not that complicated. Mm -hmm. uh, you become, you know, and you start to do that. And what happens is, oh my God, you redefine. It's like you get confident. Yeah. You get joyful. You start to share stories more. You, you, it's like you open up your, your, your literal and physical, you know, your metaphoric and physical posture and uh, you just get better in time. You become a master and you, and you celebrate and it just changes as life should be. Right. Yeah. You know, it's interesting um, because you know, I, I, I feel like a lot of people underestimate the level of activity that it requires to reach the dream. You know, I, I see this all the time. People say, I'm working, I'm, you know, I'm doing, I'm showing up, I'm doing this. But a lot of the times they're so busy in busy work, right? Mm -hmm. They're doing the clerical stuff. They're doing the behind the scenes stuff. They're, their desk is all, they're organizing their desk. They're, you know, they're, they're doing the same thing over and over again, but it's not um, dream producing. Right. It's just maintaining the current state. And that is, as a leader, I've noticed, you know, you know, people don't sometimes like to be called out on that. It's like, you know, you're, you, you know, you're complaining about where you're not right. you're complaining that, you know, these people don't show up or this person, you know, let you down or blah, blah, blah. And you're, you're looking at everybody else and you're pointing fingers, but there's three fingers pointing back at you. And what we have to really do is get clear on really what the truth is. And the truth is, is that if you want it bad enough, you have to be willing to take yourself out of the equation and quit worrying about what people are going to think about you and like authentically care about humans. It'll get you beyond that voice. But I, I absolutely agree with what you're saying. I mean, it's, I used to actually years ago, I used to set what I call my 15 minute alarm clock. I literally would set an alarm clock for every 15 minutes to go off. And the, 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 the act, it becomes, it, I mean, you don't have to do it for all that long. I did it for a time. Uh, and then it just became sort of a mental construct, 
that was bred into my being. And the, when, the, when the alarm clock went off, there was only one question I had to ask, is what I'm working on in that moment mission critical? Is it essential? Is it important? Is it going to be, a, is it going to move the needle? Or am I just being busy and doing admin and delaying and, you know, pretending to be uh, moving in the right direction? And it was shocking to me because, you know, nine times out of 10, was this really mission critical? Was it really moving the needle? No. Oh my God. I'm spending 10% of my time, 90% in preparation, right? Anyway, it's, it, it was sort of like not a metaphor. It was a very literal measuring stick, right? And it just made me become a lot more conscious about how I structure my day, um, what I pay attention to. But yeah, I think that, you know, people will use many, many, all of us, we're all, because it's just the human condition, we'll use a lot of excuses to um, sort of not face up to our greater self, our greater possibility. Hey, look, I heard this thing. I thought it was incredible. I actually heard it in a TED Talk. I'm going to give credit because Mel Robbins in a TED Talk was talking about, you know, the scientists have crunched the numbers. Um, and when I say crunch the numbers, they're looking at since the beginning of humankind, wars, natural disasters, et cetera, the dinosaurs, uh, they crunched the numbers and they figured out what are the odds that you, Christy Dryling, could be born at the moment you were born hmm. to your very parents with the DNA that is defining who and what you are, what are the odds of that occurrence? The scientists had some sort of metrics and they, they, they decided, they, they calculated it and they actually calculated that the possibility of you is one in 400 trillion. Which is to say, mm -hmm. number one, it's a miracle that each of us mm -hmm. is here. Each of us is just like, it, it's be, literally beyond comprehension. The improbability mm. of me being here, of you being here. And what does that tell us? That should tell us something, mm. right? I mean, that, you know, I, I, I do believe that everyone has the possibility of the, the capacity to change their life and the lives of many people, if not the world. But I think we all have the most remarkable story and the gifts to accompany it if we only would really acknowledge them as they are or what they are. Um, most people tell themselves a story of fiction about who they are. Mm -hmm. They put negative meaning into things where it doesn't belong. Mm -hmm. They hold themselves back uh, and feel on some soul level a little bit, maybe, gosh, I, I thought I'd be further along or I feel frustrated. Uh, and that's a shame because they're, you know, I think everyone's deserving of living. Uh, that's the joy of being here, living fully into the possibility of every day is a new opportunity, new possibility. It doesn't matter. Stop judging because the weight of the past that's a lot of rocks. Just leave it, you know, and allow yourself today to do some one special thing. Mm. You know, it could just be a generosity of, you know, being kind and loving and helping someone else, whatever, whatever it is. Mm. It's a new day. It's so beautiful that you share that because I, I was listening to a story about uh, two monks and they were walking on this journey together, they came to this this creek, and um, it was all muddy. And there was this woman standing there in this beautiful kimono, and she she was uh, afraid to cross because it, she would get very muddy and dirty. So one of the monks uh, goes up to her and puts her on his back and takes her across. And so hours down the journey, you know, down the road, they finally get to the, back to the monastery, and the, the other one of the monks says, "Can I ask you something?" why did you put that woman on your back when we're not supposed to touch women? And uh, the monk said, are you still carrying, are you still carrying the weight of her? Are you still carrying the weight of her on your back? Because that whole time he had already forgot he had did this act of kindness, this act of love. But this other one was like so caught up for hours thinking about why did he break the rule or why did he do this, this thing when, 
and, and he, and, and, and I feel like so many of us carry the weight of um, our past mistakes, rejections, failures, um, you know, where we think we should have been, could have been, we should all over ourselves. A lot of times we should have said this, done this, forgiven this. You realize it's, there, there's no end to the cycle of refining our humanity and learning lessons and, um, you know, being joyful and generous and at the same time, you know, aware that we're always students. The, the human mind is a, a, a marvelous creature and it really just, it, I mean, it loves us. It doesn't always look like love. <laughs> right. It just wants you to stay safe. It wants you to stay in the padded closet with the door closed and the light off and just like, please don't hurt yourself. It's a survival thing. But we also misunderstand what real risk is. You know, what what is threatening to us? When is that appropriate? Yeah, and I think um, oftentimes, this last couple of years, especially when COVID happened, Gary, I know for myself and many people, I really took this as a chance to really go inward. Like really, like the stuff that needed to come out, um, you know, the, the work that really needed to be addressed and done, I dove in. And sometimes what I saw and what I experienced was not pretty. And, you know, like, I, you know, there were many times I wanted to suck my thumb in a corner and be like, oh my God, this is really hard. You know, if anybody saw that I'm a global leader, they would laugh, right? And I think a lot of times people think they're alone on the journey of the healing and, 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 and it's like, but we, I've learned that you have to do the work, right? You have to do that work. You can't ignore it. You have to love yourself. You have to find that place inside of yourself and truly fall in love with you before you expect the world to fall in love with you. Right. True. True. Yeah. One of the hardest things for most people to do. And especially, you know, it's been interesting because the, the this past year plus, um, my heart goes out to so many people who really had a level of struggle that is, that's hard for some of us to imagine, um, circumstantially, familial issues, what have you. Um, it's, it, 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 it's, it's enough to bring some people to their knees. And, and it's a time when I think humanity in general was like stunned. Uh, feeling raw, feeling vulnerable, feeling the coordinates were free floating. Mm -hmm. The anchors that are so familiar were no longer there. All that is so magnificent about our capacity to be human, to be in community, to try and you know extend um, a, a kind word or a helping hand, uh, or 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 just you know to listen. Mm -hmm. um, and, part, you know, part of what you're talking about is, yeah, you know, we, we're also busy judging ourselves, for God's sakes. When you go there, the best thing, it's, it's kind of like, you know, just stop it, whatever you're doing, there's a way to stop it and give yourself that gift. And it might just be walk out on the street and find someone who needs mm -hmm. a stranger to be kind to them, go out and, 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 and look around and appreciate the beauty around you or just start to laugh for no damn reason, whatever it is, uh, because it just hurts to sit in that, right? Mm -hmm. So, uh, and I think we deserve better. We should believe in ourselves more. I really wish if I could have one superpower, <laughs> you know, it's like I went to a dinner party years ago and, and, the, and there were two questions like, you know, what do you naturally manifest? So uh, what do you manifest so naturally? What are you good at? Uh, so naturally that you don't even consider it. You're not particularly aware of it or conscious of it. And that was an interesting question. But the next question was, and if you could have a superpower, one, what would it be? And it was so interesting because the, the um, both answers came to me quickly, but the one that Matt, you know, really was interesting was the superpower. And it says, I want to go around the planet hugging people for the rest of my days. And in the moment of the hug, it's not just a hug. It's a hug that has an impact. And the hug, in the moment of the hug, people are just uh, overwhelmed with a true and deep and eternal sense of self-belief. Mm. What we see in other people, they don't see in themselves. Yeah, exactly. You know, it's so funny talking about hugs. I remember I saw this uh, YouTube video that went viral a long time. I mean, it was probably 15 years ago and the guy was giving away free hugs, right? He had a sign, free hugs. I do remember that. Oh, I do remember. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I was like so inspired by it. So I got my girlfriends together and I was like, let's do this. And we were in a small, it was Valentine's day. 
And I was like, you know what? There's going to be a lot of people today that aren't feeling loved. And so let's make yeah. the free hug sign. Let's get some roses and let's go to the grocery store. So my girlfriend and I, my girlfriend and I went to one store and another girlfriend went to another store. And so we stood there and we had free hugs sign and we had roses. <laughs> and people would walk by us and some people would say, what are you raising money for? And we're like, we're not raising money. No, well, you got to be raising money. You're giving, no, it's a free hug. Can, and they look at us like, and we're like, do you want one? Yeah, yeah, I'll take one, give you a hug. And they were like, wow. And they just walked off. And then I remember, you know, some people were like, nope, I don't want a hug. You know, this is obviously pre-COVID. Nope, no hug. I'm like, okay. And then I remember one lady literally f- fell into my arms and started weeping. Mm. Oh my God, this swing gets me emotional. <laughs> And I remember, <laughs> I haven't been hugged. I haven't been touched in eight years. And you have no idea what this feels like. And I just held her. And I thought this beautiful human who hasn't been touched in eight years and, and the difference that that day made for her. And I think that so many times we don't realize that that smile, yeah. that how are you? I see you, you matter to me, to strangers is truly is the best medicine that we can give ourselves into the world. Not our accomplishments, not our achievements, not our titles, not our bank accounts, not how much we write our checks for to this charity. But we don't need anything to be kind like that. We don't need anything but love, right? Yeah. Yeah. No, it's true. And it's all around. The opportunity is ever present. You know, when I was driving home, I was driving home yesterday nearby uh, from working out. And as I was about to turn a corner, I noticed this young gal uh, on the corner and I just was watching is she going to step off the corner or whatever. And we made eye contact and and we both smiled. And I, I just sort of waved as I turned the corner. Um, and you could just see like it just, she, her smile just got even bigger, right? It was like, we have an extraordinary capacity to, um, it takes so little, it takes so little to light up another human. It's the, it's the moment that surprises them because it's like you said, you hold up a sign that says free hugs and people are skeptical. It's like, what's, what's the deal here, right? Because um, that's not their normal frame. Mm -hmm. It's so easy to surprise one another. Yeah, yeah, it's, and and I think, this is so eloquently and beautifully started to, you know, wind down. And I think the message that came through is, is there's many messages, but I really feel like it's, it's give yourselves permission to be loved and to love. And that is the gift that you are here to give the world, not your business per se, or not, you know, this or that you, that you think it is, but it's you, you are the gift how profound it is to be radically honest with people, you know, especially, especially in those moments, say you're beating up on yourself, which people do, you know, share that, get it, like exercise the demon, like let it out there and let someone else reflect back on it, whatever, but don't sit in it and, and, and punish yourself I think there's a level of, you know, the thing that is so beautiful, truth is the most powerful thing we have as humans, our truth. And if you're, if you just practice getting better at sharing your truth in the moment, whatever it is, and having no shame about it, because it is true. Well, and it might be about you and it might not be about you. It might be about what you're, you're seeing in the other. It might be about a collective aspiration. I don't know. But if you really tell the truth and don't sugarcoat it and you say it with kindness and with heart and with soul, um, that alone is transformative. But I think, you know, radical kinship, radical communication, radical truth, um, the, 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 you know, if you give yourself those the blessing, the permission to make that your daily workout, mm. it's, it, it literally triggers magical interactions and outcomes Mm -hmm. that you can't predict Mm -hmm. it's so alluring to the human soul 
that when we see it, we know it. There's so much that we don't notice, but when you're really confronted with the truth, you notice it, especially if it's a generous and kind, not ju judgmental truth. And you can feel that in people when you meet them. Yeah. I mean, I feel that all the time. I mean, all of us feel it. Um, our BS radars, radars go go up when we're skeptical or if we're if we haven't accepted ourselves yet or trust ourselves, right? We 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 fear trusting others because we've been hurt so much, right? I know I've been hurt quite a bit, not by anybody else hurting me, but by the way I perceived the things that happened to me, and I allowed to go into. Uh, you know, painful, you know, feelings and which would then put sometimes, uh, you know, I'd guard my heart. And for you, you've known me for gosh, over a decade now, you know, when Christy guards her heart, that that's not really good, you know, cause that's just who I am. I mean, who we all are, but you know what I, I love to do well is to just really love. And, and I have always have to remind myself, like, it, you know, it doesn't, what, no, no matter what happens to us, no matter what we think is a negative or what we think's good or neutral, or it's all just happening. And, and the worst thing we can ever do is guard our hearts. You know, the, 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 the hardest thing we can do is not be aware and conscious that we're not fully showing up in our natural state because babies come out they're not coming out hating anybody. They're not coming in fear, judgment, or resentment. I mean, they come out and they trust. I mean, they're like trusting, they're loving. Yeah, they're, they cry and they when they don't get what they want, you know, and all of that. But they're pretty loving until us humans come in and project all these things onto them. And you cast these things that are things onto them. And then they wind up carrying some of the things that we cast it onto them. And sure. And so that's who we are is love. And, 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 and you are that, all of you are that. We are that. And as a collective, as a co collective and as a collaborative, you know, um, beautiful souls here today, we've all, we together with this power, it's like, it's just mad. Like what we're doing now, the work we're doing as a collective and the listeners and the ones that they're, we are now raising this awareness and vibration on the planet by coming together in this, right? So this was just a reminder. And I, I'm really grateful for you, Gary, for taking this time out of your busyness. And, you know, one, one, I, one question I've asked people that I've always been inspired by um, is a question that's impacted my life with many different stories. And I want to leave you with this question. And I didn't prepare you before, so I don't know what's going to come out, okay, which is great. Um, but if you were to leave all of these people here and myself with, with um, any words of wisdom that we can take on and carry with us in our lifetime and throughout our days, wh what would you share with us? The, no one's replaceable doesn't happen without all of us. Then just remember who you are, allow that to be, and then you can come back into present time into what needs to happen today and tomorrow and the next day. But, you know, try and expand the frame a little bit and see yourself as the magical opportunity, the life that you are, the personality that you are that you represent and embody everything that's come before and the possibility of what more going forward. It's kind of amazing. Well, and so it is done. Uh, what a, a beautiful morning to spend with you and then to get the extra uh, reminder, you know, that the universe is trying to wake you all up to listen to this message, the ending statements here, that it's real and it's truth and, um, and that I really hope that everybody here really could feel and, and really resonate with their truth by hearing, you know, the possibilities that lie within each and every one of us. And I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for the human that you are. You know, you every day show up in a magnificent way to create 
and to share and to contribute. I admire you not for what you've done. That's beautiful, but I admire you for who you are. And every day I think I am so grateful to call you my friend because you inspire me to continually to show up better, to show up more and to believe in the power that is within me And that reflection is a gift to the world because so many people are so focused on themselves. They're not reflecting to others, their possibilities. And so I really want to thank you for the time. You're a treasure. And I look forward um, for more journeys with you, uh, teaching with you. And I would hope everybody, if you're not following if you're not following Gary, go follow him on his Instagrams and his all his handles, his love handles. <laughs> he doesn't have love handles. <laughs> oh my gosh. I gotta, gotta go work out somewhere. <laughs> he doesn't have it. Oh my gosh, that was good. Oh. Um, but he's on Instagram, Gary W. Goldstein, right? Gary W. Goldstein. It's Gary W. Goldstein on everything. Yeah. And he's the um, only Gary Chris- W. Goldstein. <laughs> yeah. I love, um, I love you, Christy Dryling. It's always, you know, you're like my sister, my, you know, like you're stuck with me for life. So big hugs to everybody. Another incredible episode of the Lead with Love podcast. You know, so much of success is failure, failing into success. They really go hand in hand. And the other part of that is radical self-love dedication to the growth and just loving the human experience so we really hoped you enjoyed this episode as much as we enjoyed creating it remember to like and subscribe and we'll see you soon